And we need to decide the kind of world we want to live in. And the only way we can make those decisions is if we know what's going on. And that can't happen without a free press. And that can't happen without people willing to stand up and speak the truth, even when that's a very dangerous thing to do. Whistleblowers are the pioneers of change. Daniel Ellsberg is the source of the Pentagon documents. It is time to quit making national heroes out of those who steal secrets and publish them in the newspaper. I began copying the Pentagon papers to give them to the American Congress and share them with the American public. I came to realize that a, that a wrongful war was going on and would continue to go on unless these lies were exposed. He is the preeminent whistleblower in the deepest sense. Whistleblowers have become a kind of fundamental part of how our democracy works. Mark Felt, the former associate director of the FBI, revealed that he was the man that helped bring down the Nixon administration. They have unquestionable patriotism and a lot of courage. His testimony was a key to the eventual $246 billion settlement with five tobacco companies. Jeffrey Wigand brought down big tobacco. Former Enron employee Sharon Watkins, better known as the Enron ex cop Frank Serpico, changed the NYPD forever when he revealed a multi million dollar payoff corruption scam. You have to go up against the odds to do the right thing. Karen Silkwood took on one of the biggest companies in America, crusading against America's nuclear power industry. And in the face of fear, she continued to collect it the It changed history. What they and the genuine American hero, Jeff Weinberg, refused to put it into a What? greatest gift that the national security state ever got was obviously the ability to exploit the fear of 9-11 very aggressively without opposition to enjoy this massive booming growth and power. Exerting that vast power, the national security state surrounds itself within a wall of silence where whistleblowers and the free press are attacked and vilified even when lives are at stake. Major Megan McClung was killed by an IED while riding in a Humvee was a tipping point for me. I had to do something. If not me, then who? And if not now, then when? It was one of those situations. And I just said, no, no, no. It doesn't matter what the consequences are, personal or otherwise, right? I said, this needs to be fixed. Whistleblowers are just people who said there's something more important here than my boss, or the general, or the admiral, or the president. The most common vehicle used was the Humvee. They were never built to withstand weapons that the insurgents were using, these IEDs. The estimates are that about a third of the casualties in Iraq were due to Humvees. Hundreds of Marines were tragically lost, and probably thousands maimed unnecessarily. So I, I said, let's replace the Humvees with what are called MRAPs, mine resistant ambush protective vehicles. The MRAP was bound to save lives. It's more survivable than the Humvee because it has this V hull that deflects the blast out rather than focusing it or carrying it straight up. The base is much higher off the ground, so it's further away from the center of the blast. Tailor made for bombs were IEDs, but it wasn't a new solution. The Marines had asked for MRAPs, but that request had been pushed back. The Pentagon, intentionally or unintentionally, had preventably caused 19 months in delays, and that had a direct impact on lost lives, unnecessarily. That came with these concerns to my supervisors. No success. Then communicating directly with the agency that's supposed to be providing the support. No luck there. Then working with Systems Command. Well, Systems Command depended on other parties. No luck there. And so I was determined to bring this to the 
attention of the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense. But when the officials saw the brief that I was going to present, they said, absolutely not. That cannot be allowed to go forward. And when they get to the end of that chain of command and it becomes more important that nobody get embarrassed, that some people eventually decide, you know what, I'm going to do the outside play. I contacted Sharon Weinberg of the blog called Danger Room. He was a champion for fighting against the Pentagon bureaucracy that was, that was slowing things down. Military industrial. And the military piece is supposed to be in charge. Tell the industry, you know? But what happens is the bureaucracy has its own interests. And we had documents backing it up, and so we, we went ahead and published it. Publishes the actual document on Danger Room, which was very, very helpful. That got the attention of Senator Biden and his staff. They asked whether I would like to speak to USA Today. I said yes. I got a call from Tom Vandenbroek, I believe, the very next day. And as soon as I found out about Franz, I thought, oh my god, I've got a real live, honest to god, whistleblower who knows what's going on. I provided him unclassified information which was key to understanding the issue. I thought immediately we were embarking on a bigger project to find out why these vehicles hadn't been getting there in the first place. And immediately he took and ran with it. He understood and was fortunately able to bring this to a front page article. These have to be genuine, important issues that are being exposed. And in Fran's case, when you hear about decisions that are made that save thousands of lives, there's nothing more important than that. Now, a new Pentagon study. Are our troops getting what they need when they need it? Is the U.S. military shortchanging its troops? According to Franz Geil, the Marine bureaucracy has continued to under-equip our troops for years. I contend that officials knowingly delayed or refused the provision of ur urgently requested capabilities like MRAP. Geil says hundreds of troops have been killed. Delays in military They're not going to tell you what's broken. And the only way to find that out is from people on the inside. So they couldn't allow something like this to happen again. Fight them with truth. That's what it's all about. Now it's in the press, and now the commandant's getting asked about it during Senate Armed Services Committee testimony. Does the administration have a plan to replace each of those Humvees <laughs> in Iraq with some variation of an MRAP? We don't have an answer right now on how long-term I think the uh, MRAP is going to be. Two, three days after, actually, my story had run on MRAPs, I was taken aside by a senior defense official who told me that my access was going to dry up for writing a story like that. It wasn't going to change the way I reported, but um, I thought it was interesting that you know someone at his level would take the time to um, make that threat. They were using all these personnel actions against me. I'm the substandard employee, bottom 3%, unreliable, untrustworthy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. After investigations and after all these, re these, these personnel actions and reprisals, I was placed on administrative leave. The MRAPs are starting to get media attention, but the guy who makes it happen, Franz Geil, is losing his security clearance and is getting pounded on in his own job. I was fearful. If I, if I have to leave the government now and I don't have security clearances, we're gonna have to move away. I can't get a job around here. You can't do anything without a security clearance around the D.C. area. I knew that life was gonna go fall off a cliff. With the things that's going through in his head and work and family and my children, all this chaos thing, we, we, we went through with it. I mean, like, tough time, you know, but we hang in there, et cetera. When Gates saw the stuff the whistleblower was pushing out there, everything changed. Secretary of Defense Gates, first thing he did is established what was called the MRAP Task Force. Vehicles like the MRAP provide the best protection available against roadside bombs, and so the need for these kinds of vehicles will not soon go away. The MRAP started going out there en masse. This is the largest acquisition program for the Department of Defense since World War II. Working around the clock to keep these trucks in the fight. We sent more than 24,000 MRAPs to our warfighters. This MRAP saved the lives of five Marines who were in it. 
dust everywhere, and then when the dust settled, everybody was like, are we okay, are we okay? And we, were, we were all good and moved on. We protected our soldiers, that's what matters. We were in a lot better shape than had we been in a Humvee. It made a difference, saved lives every day. We were all lucky to be alive. Them rap saved my life. We were able to bring everybody home alive. The number of deaths and maimings just plummet. I've been a reporter for 25 years, and there's nothing that's been more satisfying than, than this story. Because a whistleblower stood up and said, you know what, this is the right thing to do. Lives were saved. And that, to me, is, is the definition of a hero. My husband, he, I consider him a hero, but he didn't think he wanted me to call him a hero like that because he loves the Marine, and he just, like, he just did what he needs to do. You know, he just, I'm proud of him. I love you, honey. I think, I think you are so good, and I'm very, very proud of you. We made it happen, and uh, that was hugely satisfying. He's losing his job while the right thing is happening. This is where wonderful advocates who have been helping me all these years really came to the rescue. We at the Project on Government Oversight worked with our colleagues at the Government Accountability Project, and we started a public campaign to ask people around the country to demand to protect the man who actually is helping to save our troops. And we got thousands and thousands of letters. Pogo approached the Office of Special Counsel. They actually cited our public appeal in their ruling in, in his favor. At that point, the Marine Corps contacted me immediately and said, well, now you can come back to work. But why didn't they do the right thing? Since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan began, it's been the heydays for defense contracting. The biggest problem is the lack of oversight. We have a system that doesn't want to find out what's going on. It comes down to money and reputations. There's a lot of money behind the Humvee, a lot of lobbying behind the Humvee. Tens of millions, hundreds of millions, if you take into account the Army contracts as well. A lot of the money that's allegedly spent to defend us is really about greed, it's about waste. From a fiscal conservative's perspective, we need to change that kind of cycle and get to a point where money is being spent more efficiently, more effectively, and more accountably. It is the military-industrial complex. I'm not some left-wing guy who has grabbed onto that concept. You know, I'm, I would consider myself a conservative, uh, uh, patriotic American, but it's real. And there are so many conflicts of interest. This is the beast that we have in industrialized society. This problem is real. systems of surveillance that watch everything we do. And they allow them at any point to turn a key and say, I want to know everything this person did for the last five years. I've already captured this already collected. It's ready for the The more powerful the national security state becomes, the more we need whistleblowers. It is all in the classified realm. What we discovered as a result of our research is that there are over 1,200 government organizations working at the top secret level on counterterrorism. There are another close to 2,000 companies that work for the government on top secret matters. And they're all located in about 10,000 locations throughout the country. There are close to a million people who have top secret clearance. We talk about a national security state uh, that pretends that it's interested in national security, but in fact it's interested in the security of corporate interests, of agency interests, of politicians keeping their jobs. It is, as one uh, source said, a self-licking ice cream cone. It's there to support itself. The national security state is an establishment that involves huge expenditures whose effectiveness and efficiency are questionable. Secrecy is always the linchpin of abuses of power. If you can't exercise your power in the dark, people have insufficient power to hold you accountable. And unfortunately, right now, we've seen a big crackdown on whistleblowers. 
Whistleblowers are under attack in ways they've never been before in history. I was interviewed by one of the journalists in advance of the public, and they asked me what I thought was going to happen. They said, they're going to use legal processes, they would condemn me in the media, you know, they would go after my reputation, they would try to my job, they would freeze my assets, they would harass my family, the things that's happened every day. But they went much, much further. Obama administration's been extremely um, aggressive in trying to root out whistleblowers within the government. I think President Obama feels this way because he's grown very close to the CIA and to the classified military operators. Both of those are in the deepest of the secret world. At one point, they actually brought down the presidential plane of Bolivia, Abel Morales, to search it because they thought I might be on board uh, traveling to Latin America to pursue an assignment plan. Uh, and there's no precedent for it. it. It never happened. The impact of this administration's aggressiveness in the national security arena has had an extraordinary uh, chilling effect. Uh, the number of people who have indicated to us they wish they could talk, but they can't because they're so afraid of what could happen to them. It's a terrible thing for our democracy. My name's uh, Thomas Drake. I took the oath four times in my government career to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies born and domestic. I joined NSA as a senior executive primarily responsible for electronic foreign intelligence. 9-11 was my first day on the job. After in processing, taking the oath, getting all my paperwork straightened out, we were in this meeting and it was a rather dramatic moment, particularly the second hour being hit. And I remember standing up saying, America is under attack. Nightmare is Armageddon right here. And I'm calling out to all the intelligence agencies and departments. Whatever you have in the labs, we need to put into the fight. I was literally charged to be the leader at NSA to go out and find all of these programs. We're filtering through the vast reams of data being generated by the digital age, the internet age, and providing the intelligence on it as it's being generated while protecting the rights of Americans. It was the prime directive at NSA, you do not spy on Americans without a warrant. And then, as I discovered to my horror, the government is conducting blanket electronic surveillance with no controls, no accountability, and no oversight. NSA would have extraordinary penetration of U.S. citizenry in terms of spying and surveillance. I was so concerned because I remember telling my immediate supervisor, what are we doing? It was the most chilling of conversations I've probably had because here he is telling me, it's all been approved, uh, don't worry about it, and don't ask any more questions. My name is Michael DeCourt. I was the lead system engineer to um, the Deepwater program. The federal government is spending billions of dollars to improve the fleet of the U.S. Coast Guard. A massive modernization program called Deepwater. This is the largest acquisition program in the Coast Guard's history. 91 new ships and 124 smaller boats. A $24 billion project. The Deepwater System program will provide our nation with a 21st century Coast Guard. But the program has serious problems. And it ended up way over its head. One day, somebody came to me and they said, I'm going to tell you something, just so my conscience is clear. The radios that they were putting on the smaller boats that were exposed uh, were not waterproof. Some of the systems mounted on the outside of the boat wouldn't survive uh, harsh elements or harsh weather. The radios would have failed if they even got a little bit wet. And, and you need a radio to communicate, right? The backup for that radio not being on that small boat is a flare. If you could screw something up in that area, you're pretty much open game for anything else. Some of the things I found on my own, some of it was brought to me though, right? Some things that people told me about. There's a point at which the boats were not designed properly with their hull extensions and they buckled. They were all bending. And if you can imagine them going out in very high seas, the, the boats would have just fell apart. It just um, snowballed. 
So if you make a design error, but you do not correct it, you do not tell somebody about it, you do not, and you misrepresent that design problem, and you say everything's fine, now you've just crossed into the, the point from making a mistake to willful intent and to, to fraud. I didn't want a loss of life, right? So that, that was my thing. I, I didn't want a loss of life. Lives of the people doing the rescuing, but also average citizens, right? I mean, the Coast Guard rescues people who are in trouble from fishing outings or storms or whatever. I wanted to make sure that if something bad happened to one of these boats or somebody in the general public or whatever, that uh, I didn't want that on my conscience. Like most people, maybe they tell their boss and then they drop it. That, that wasn't good enough. My name is uh, Thomas Tam. I'm an, uh, currently an attorney uh, doing criminal defense litigation. I was hired as an attorney at the Department of Justice and wound up at what was then called the Office of Intelligence Policy and Review. And after 9-11, uh, my unit was uh, assigned to go talk to the victims' families of 9-11 in New York. And uh, so we were gathering uh, victim impact information and it was actually really largely as a result of that that I decided that I wanted to do something more directly uh, going after terrorists. I mean, I thought it was kind of my patriotic duty to go after the people that had attacked my country. And I thought it would be really rewarding. There's a court at the time located in the Department of Justice that literally meets in a bank vault. Uh, so there can't be any uh, surreptitious listening of what to what's going on in there. And we applied for uh, th through the court to listen to people's phones, essentially. Let's say someone was uh, picked up uh, uh, by our troops in Afghanistan or the CIA in Afghanistan and they had phone numbers in their pockets and those phone numbers were listed to people in the United States. And so with that information uh, that, that, that the persons picked up in Afghanistan, we would go before court and say, here's why we think this person may be connected with uh, terrorism. And if the court said, yes, we believe there's an probable cause, they would issue a warrant and we would be able to listen, the government would be able to gather intelligence, gather surveillance, email addresses, telephones, and um, we could do that for 90 days. So we were working with FBI agents who had developed probable cause to believe someone in the country was connected with terrorist organizations. But there was a certain smaller number of phone numbers that would come into this office that had to be handled separately and, and kind of given special attention. And we didn't call it any special uh, code word or name. It was just known as the program. I just found that really curious. And I started asking people that I worked with if they knew any of the details about the program. You know, do, do you know why? Uh, one phone number is in the program and one phone number is not in the program. Basically, I uh, was convinced that something illegal was going on. So I asked a supervisor and she said to me that she just assumed that what was being done was illegal. I knew that if I remained silent, that I would be an accessory to a crime, the subversion of our own constitution and warrantless spying and surveillance. People work within the system. I went to the Office of General Counsel. Worked their chain of command. I went to the House Permits Select Committee on Intelligence. They expect that someone is going to see the light along the way. I went to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and I went to the Department of Defense Inspector General's office. I was being told it's all legal. So I'd spent some time trying to demonstrate to them that these uh, radios needed to be switched out and the hulls were not safe. I utilized the process the way it was supposed to be used and notified everybody all the way up through to the CEO and the board of directors. The president that I was trying to deal with at the time, his name is Fred Musali, right, who not only had Deep Order, but also the Aegis Weapon System Program, and uh, he refused to talk to me. He did everything the way you should be doing it. He goes to the top people of his company and said, these are major problems. We need to do something about this. And they did not want to hear it. I'm running out of options. But my whole thought was, I'm, I'm going to try everything I think I can try. And then my conscience will be clear. That whole do is to others as you would wish to have done to yourself. I, I actually believe in that. So uh, it, it's a relative to my kids. If I say, don't lie or don't, you know, don't screw anybody over, 
the times when that matters most is when you'd most like to or try to justify your doing so. I thought, I, kinda, I have a responsibility to keep going with this. So I, it just, uh, I kind of didn't even think twice about it. There were uh, wiretaps, electronic surveillance conducted without getting search warrants, without getting a legal piece of paper that said that you could do that. We took a separate track that's kind of circumvent the normal process and circumvent the court. And I said, really? I said, aren't we supposed to, you know, that's why we're here is to do things that are legal, to do it the right way, catch bad people, and we think that we are doing something illegal? It's a federal crime. It's in the statute. It's, there's no really, no arguments, no questions about it. It's a federal crime to listen to somebody's phone without getting a warrant. I came to the decision that I thought that the American people should know and let the American people decide whether they thought it was, uh, that the government was doing what they uh, considered uh, legal or, or not. We see governments are increasingly starting to shut us out. They're starting to change the processes by which they govern. And they say, hey, you know, these are really important things, but you'll just have to trust that we are making the right decisions about how these powers should be used. And particularly in America, that's a fundamentally un-American concept. This is supposed to be government of the people, by the people, for the people. But how do we make decisions about how we want to vote? How do we make decisions about what kind of government we would like if we don't know what those governments are doing? I ultimately chose, I've made a fateful decision to go to the press. So I shared what was unclassified anonymously about the government's warrantless wiretapping with a reporter. Her name is Siobhan Gorman, and I wrote for the Baltimore Sun. I knew that I could be fired, but again, as an American, I made that choice. There was a May 2006 article about warrantless surveillance of Americans. That really, no doubt, caused real, a real stir in NSA. just recently read an article about the Justice Department written by a reporter for the New York Times and recognized that he seemed to have a pretty good handle on what was going on in the Department of Justice and thought that if I make a phone call, I don't want to use my cell phone. I don't want to use my phone at home because they could potentially uh, find records of that. And I would go by uh, on the subway every day the uh, kind of old-fashioned pay phones. I thought about various investigative reporters that I would try and contact. I remember picking up the cradle of the phone and calling a reporter by the name of Eric Litchwell. Once I put the phone down, I knew I was committed to the path I had decided to take. I was pretty confident that my life would never be quite the same. Uh, they are people who want to speak up and usually tell you about something that they think is really wrong, and sometimes they're willing to risk their jobs to do that. But if they do act on it, they're going to be risking everything. We, we nickname whistleblowing the sound of professional suicide. It's almost always bad for them. It's almost, they're the ones who are putting their careers on the line. I met him at a bookstore, so I was nowhere uh, connected to the Department of Justice, and we had a cup of coffee, and I told him that I worked at the Department of Justice, and I might have some information that he might find useful, interesting, newsworthy. I expressed, expressed to the New York Times reporter that I didn't want to actually turn over what I consider would be classified information, so I would give them information about this separate track of uh, cases and the fact that people thought it was illegal in the office where I work. I initially met with Eric Litchwell numerous times, uh, felt I could trust him, and then he brought in another reporter named James Risen, who I was informed had sources from other agencies, presumably the NSA and the CIA. He assured me that the New York Times would protect sources, that they would never reveal my identity. And so that's kind of how it began. I don't really uh, uh, like thinking about uh, that period of time in my life all that much because it really was stressful and it was something that I didn't think I could talk to anybody about. Uh, and I didn't want to involve uh, my family uh, because they would be worried. 
The Bush administration is fighting mad at the New York Times. But I believe it was November or December of 2005. The New York Times ran a front page story that there was a warrantless wiretapping program. And when it first came out, I, I was, I think I was undoubtedly trembling as I was uh, uh, looking at it uh, to read the story very carefully and see whether there was any way that somebody could read that story and figure out uh, who uh, had revealed this information. My first reaction was, was that, oh my God, <laughs> you know, what have I done? President Bush is breaking the law by spying on people in this country He's without dropping on Americans without court Could order. the government be listening into your private conversations? The secret wiretapping without warrants of communications between U.S. residents and people Listening overseas. of conversations and monitoring of emails without a warrant a under the law is unreasonable and unconstitutional. Means he's been warrant. lying to us about the program since it started when he's been telling us there's nothing the illegal government. about what he's doing. In effect, can wiretap you, they can snoop on you, they can break into your Bush house. They only listen to Americans if it involves Al Qaeda. These two say allowing for the warrantless wiretapping of Americans. President Bush is breaking the law. Most experts in the of, of, of communicate. Some in the press, in particular the New York Times, have made the job of defending against further terrorist attacks more difficult. We're at war with a bunch of people who want to hurt the United States of America, and for people to leak that program and for a newspaper to publish it does great harm to the United States of America. They said all these publishers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, will have blood on their hands from publishing these stories. But when we look at it, we see that these threats, these statements from the government about what we, the public, simply cannot be trusted to know because this is knowledge that's just too dangerous, is actually not true. Give us one example where this has caused harm. Show us anybody who's died as a result of this because you told us if any of these documents were ever made public, it would cause grave damage to the country. You notice there's a high correlation between how secret news is and how bad it is for the people. They don't trust us to know these things because it's embarrassing, because it could affect them politically. But it doesn't actually increase the threat to us as a public or a society. And it's for that reason that we need to look very carefully and very critically and the claims any official puts forward about how dangerous this sort of thing is. I was in my car in the parking lot, and I remember thinking, okay, I gotta do something else. I, I tried to think of something that I thought would be catching, so I thought I would do a YouTube video. All they were using it for at the time was, you know, goofy pet tricks. Nobody ever used YouTube for as a whistleblower, right? And that was the angle I was trying to go for. So I wrote a script, and I had one of those cheap com computer cameras, and I read it one time, and it seemed OK. And then I, I, I just, the second one was, was the take. <laughs> Before I begin, I want to tell you that making videos like this is not something I do as a profession. So I broke all the rules of, of a professional. But my thought was that that's not the point, because it, it, to, to some degree, I was, you know, I was running out of ideas at the time. The purpose of this video is to ask for your assistance in helping me resolve several serious safety and security issues. But then after that, I had a, a listing of dozens and dozens of reporters in both print and media, and I told them that I posted the video. I was a reporter covering Homeland Security, and while doing research on the Deepwater Project, Michael DeCourt told me really explosive information. I took his tips, and then I used that to report. I talked to the companies involved, and I was able to basically confirm individual allegations he was making. That's incredible to see that the federal government made such a terrible mistake. Then I thought, well, here we go, because it's all momentum. You can find the most unusual videos on YouTube.com, but one of them has raised questions about a potential homeland security problem. Now his story has gotten more public attention in just a few weeks than in all the months he spent rattling the cage through traditional means. The Coast Guard's own expert warned radios placed in open boats shorted out because they weren't waterproof and of serious design flaws that could lead to catastrophic hull collapse. It takes a lot of guts to do what Michael DeCourt did, to blow the whistle on the largest defense contractor in the world. When I brought this information to Lockheed Management, they directed me and my team to stop looking into whether or not the rest of the equipment met requirements. 
you have provided enormous service to the public, to the committee, and I think in the long run to the Coast Guard. I remember sitting at lunch with people and saying, you know, this could get on 60 Minutes. The $24 billion project has turned into a fiasco that has set new standards for incompetence and triggered a Justice Department investigation. Michael DeCourt was Lockheed Martin's lead engineer for electronics on the patrol boats. We actually ordered radios for very, the very small boats that go on the 123s that were not waterproof. That is hard to believe. Yes, sir. I'm getting ready for work. I'm looking out my bedroom window, and I see a bunch of cars pull up. A dozen agents are streaming across my front yard. Thomas Drake accused of leaking classified information. You can imagine in that moment, it come for me. Don knock on the door. Agents raiding his home in Howard County. My wife and son, I still remember the look on their, on their faces. They had a warrant, they had a search warrant. My life at that point was com turned completely upside down. I met the chief prosecutor at an, a secret FBI facility um, in Maryland. Uh, where the prosecutor basically threatened me with spending the rest of my life in prison if I didn't cooperate, otherwise we'll throw the book at you. And I was charged under the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act, which has been around since 1917, was designed to stop spies. But a spy is not a mid-level bureaucrat who notices tens of millions of dollars going down a rat hole somewhere, and after notifying his superiors and getting nowhere, eventually drops a dime and calls a newspaper. That's a whistleblower, that's not a spy. By using the Espionage Act, they're saying, not only are we gonna retaliate against whistleblowers, we're gonna try to throw them in jail. I said, you know, I think they're gonna charge me with the Espionage Act. Uh, they're gonna say that I gave information to our enemies. But the reality is, I gave this information to the American public. So, if they're the enemies, what does that say about what's going on? The deterrent effect here. Uh, is very great. These people face a terrifying situation. I mean, possible imprisonment, huge legal bills. We are in whole new territory here, and it's a really sad commentary on how far the secrecy regime and expanded executive authority has gone in this country. All it takes is for the government to assert that you have unauthorized possession of information relating to the national defense. Whistleblowing is when someone discloses fraud, waste, abuse, illegality, or danger to public health or safety. Leaking serves no public value. Ten felony counts, five under the Espionage Act, one for obstruction of justice, and four for making false statements, all of which, if I was found guilty on, would mean 35 years in prison. The substance of the espionage charges against Drake dealt with some, um, some documents that the FBI had discovered in a search of his residence. There was a very innocuous email, one of these rally the workforce uh, emails, and there was absolutely no sensitive information that was contained in there. The government claimed that it could cause damage to national security. They say it revealed levels of NSA's capability. It revealed no capabilities whatsoever. I mean, what was secret about that? One of the reasons that so much classified information leaks out is that there is so much classified information. In 2011, there were 92 million classification decisions, four times as many classification decisions as the last year of George W. Bush. That's not increased transparency, of course. That's closing the curtains. They've classified so much information that it has a a negative effect of not letting the right hand know what the left hand is doing because there's too much secrecy. The danger is when we, the public, begin to lose sight over what those private hands are doing with all that power. Classification can be deliberately abused to deny information to others for political reasons or reasons of precluding embarrassment, and it, it definitely contributes to uh, a lack of accountability. Our security is not just a matter of uh, our ability to conduct 
covert warfare or counterterrorism measures. It has to do with uh, having a public that trusts its government. The Obama administration came to power promising the most transparent administration in history. The way to make government responsible is to hold it accountable, make it transparent so that the American people can know exactly what decisions are being made and whether their interests are being well served. We're going to be incredibly transparent, sunlight everywhere, hope and change for whistleblowers. But all that quickly darkened. I never imagined that he would just run with it and take it far beyond even what the Bush administration had implemented. When he became president, I think that he tipped much more towards being protective of the secrets. Instead of getting hope and change for whistleblowers, the Obama administration had cracked down on national security whistleblowers, much more so than the Bush administration. This administration has been using the Espionage Act to, to, to take whistleblowers to court. Divulging that kind of information is a serious issue and, and always has been. They have indicted more people for uh, violating secrecy than all of the previous administrations put together. Unfortunately, the climate in the Obama administration is just not good for national security whistleblowers. They wanted to make an example of me, but in the worst possible way. So you can imagine how I'm feeling, absolutely betrayed by my own government. I mean, at the end of the day, right, you may, when you make a decision like this, and what I tell other whistleblowers, actually, is if you're not prepared to have the worst happen, and go 110%, then really don't do it at all, because it's really not worth it. Because the other side, they're getting new and new cadre of lawyers who are coming up to the ranks that they will pay to, to go against you. Shortly thereafter, I'm still an employee of the Department of Justice. Uh, I get a phone call from the FBI, and he said that he wanted to come by and talk to me. And I said, uh, I told him, OK, that would be fine, and that I would get back to him. I put him off, put him off, and then uh, invoked my rights under the Bill of Rights and told him that I did not uh, choose to be interviewed. I certainly knew that I needed a lawyer, so I contacted a lawyer and, and asked him to represent me. So I felt that it probably wasn't appropriate for me to stay employed by the Department of Justice, so I voluntarily left. beautiful summer day, uh, August of uh, 2007. I came home from uh, taking uh, my son uh, to school and saw that there were 12, 12 cars parked all along one side of the street. One of them was blocking my driveway. And, um, and I saw my lawyer standing there who had never been to my house, uh, standing in the, in the middle of the street. And, my heart just sunk. Eighteen agents, uh, some of them in body armor, I'm told, uh, had been banging on our front door, and our dog was barking. My wife was still in her bathrobe, and they were yelling at her, show us your hands and things like that. And then when she opened the door, all 18 came in fairly quickly, all went to pre-assigned spots and went up and woke up my other two kids in bed, told them to get dressed. And, um, you know, my wife was still trembling when I, when I got home. They took out a lot of personal papers that, that would have just shown that I was very interested, in my view of it, that I was very interested in the issue of wiretapping without obtaining warrants. They asked my family about whether New York Times reporters had ever been to the house. They uh, looked for secret compartments and um, took all of our computers. So a, a couple of days after the raid, I remember being in my attorney's office and he said that they've offered me a plea. The government has offered me a plea to a count of espionage, having something to do with the Espionage Act, and that it would contemplate that I would be potentially jailed for a period of time. And I really didn't think about it all that long. I didn't hesitate in saying, no, I wasn't interested in pleading because I didn't think I had done anything wrong. I hadn't turned over any documents. They hadn't gotten any secret documents out of my house. I hadn't removed any documents from 
a secret court or anything along those lines. And I just basically said, no, I, they, they're going to have to try me and, uh, and convict me. I'm spending tens, of, tens and tens of thousands of dollars during this time period on a private attorney. Um, I had to take out a second mortgage in my house. I had to basically clear out half of my retirement uh, account uh, from the government just to pay for all this, plus a whole number of other expenses. And I happened to read an article. It was, it was an op-ed in the LA Times penned by Jocelyn Radak. When I heard that a whistleblower had been indicted, I immediately did an op-ed on the difference between leaking and whistleblowing and discussed Tom Drake's case and why what he allegedly did qualified as whistleblowing, not leaking. She understood exactly what was at stake, and it turned out way before anybody else did. His case, if it were to be one, would have to occur both in the courtroom and in the court of public opinion. And she began to strategically turn the tide. I said, I'm going to nominate him for Ridenauer Prize for Truth Telling as a first stop. I did not take an oath to support and defend government illegalities, followed shortly by the Jane Mayer article. Jesslyn Rada called me up one day and she said, I, you know, I have something that I think might interest you. If we could get an article in the New Yorker, I thought it would be appropriate for him to be able to speak during that article. Dealing with a source who's being prosecuted for leaking. I could not talk on the phone with Tom Drake. I had to fly across the country and meet people in sort of unmarked hotel rooms in order to try to get the details of that story. And it does not feel kind of like um, America, land of the free press. Today it remains the most comprehensive summary of what happened. And then the 60 Minutes second. He's been charged under the Espionage Act and could spend the rest of his life in prison. I began to have grave concerns about the decisions that were made to bypass the Constitution willfully and deliberately. Over the period of a year, I learned that the FBI uh, knew who I had had lunch with on certain days. They obviously had wiretapped my phone. So I knew I was being followed, and I knew that I was being watched, and I knew that I was being investigated. The day after this raid on my house, I got a phone call from a person who identified himself as Michael Isikoff of Newsweek. I got a tip that uh, a, a squad of FBI agents had shown up at the house of a, um, a, a, of a Justice Department lawyer alarm bells uh, went off in my mind that this was related um, to the criminal investigation into who leaked the information about warrantless wiretapping to the New York Times. It led me to want to tell his story. I decided to talk to Michael Isikoff because I was convinced that I had not done anything illegal. He agreed to talk to me. Classic case of um, a whistleblower who comes across information that is truly troubling. And I could either wait for them to charge me if they were gonna charge me, or I could be proactive. I thought it went fairly well. I mean, I remember, remember talking to him, and it eventually came out, you know, that I actually had pictures of myself with Jag or Hoover as a kid. He came from a family that was steeped in FBI history. His uncle had been a top aide to J. Edgar Hoover. His brother was an FBI agent. His father was a uh, top uh, official in the FBI. And he, he just kind of lit up at that. Oh, that's absolutely a fascinating connection. And um, I got a sense of what led him to take the steps he did, uh, that he had tried to bring his concerns to somebody at the uh, Intelligence Committee and had been rebuffed. And you know, there was kind of this understanding that he wasn't going to run with the story until I told him that it was OK. And it was an issue where I ended up feeling I could trust him. When my story uh, came out on the cover of Newsweek, I basically thought, OK, I've done it. Uh, this is going to help. Here's why I did it. Here's what I did, and if you all think that, that you can charge me with that, then, then go for it. Again, I thought it was 
uh, the right thing to do, to go to the press and to let the American people decide that there might be something going on that was not following the law. Today, the, both the government and the contractors try to keep sort of the dirty laundry to themselves. And the whistleblowers are really critical to helping us get through that barrier that this sort of unified contractor government force creates. The story that I wrote and, and Michael DeCourt's work to bring it to light sort of helped expose that, that scandal. And uh, the government has, you know, I think improved as a result. The boats, the first eight were taken out of service. The program was stopped. Some of the designs on the other boats and future boats were changed. The price I paid as a whistleblower was they eliminated my job. I left the world's largest defense contractor. I mean, I would have had a 20-year pension by now. Anyone who takes a step like that, you know that they've probably got something important to say um, because they're basically wiping away their career. And then we had to move a couple times, and, and nobody else in the defense industry will touch me. So it causes some financial hardship. I mean, there's unfortunate parts, um, but I, I have no regrets. There are still problems. and. Soon, and it's unfortunate, but the Coast Guard is in such bad shape that there will probably be a loss of life in the near future because the, the boats that should have been replaced by now that weren't because of this mismanagement are still out there. A high-profile failure for the Justice Department. Federal prosecutors today dropped nearly all of the charges against Thomas Drake. A former NSA official accused of mishandling classified data strikes a plea deal today. He's only pleading guilty to a misdemeanor count of exceeding authorized use of a computer. It's the legal equivalent of a parking ticket. It had nothing to do with classified. It had nothing to do with retention. There was a judge with the integrity to say, you're not doing the right thing, prosecutor. The federal judge in this case actually berated the prosecutors. He berated the government for years of persecution, the threat of 35 years behind bars, and the charges were suddenly dropped. So the whole case did fall apart, and um, of its own weight, I think, really. The government does tend to overreact and overcharge and over overdramatize. He was vindicated in the end, essentially, but uh, had his life, uh, for the moment, ruined. It's extremely dangerous in America right now to be right as a whistleblower when the government is so wrong. So speaking truth to power is now a criminal act. One's rights, given history, it seems to be it's too easy for others to take them away. When government gains new powers, they never release them. They always use times of emergency. They use special circumstances to create exceptions in our thinking, to say that, but this time it's different. It's not different. What's different are the people in power and what they want to do. And if you put your trust in me, I will stand up at that convention and say that our divisions I was very optimistic about hope and change coming in 2008. I thought the Obama administration would actually say that I had done the right thing, that I had followed the law, and we would even be honored if you would come back and work for the Department of Justice. And I mean, in retrospect, how stupid and naive could I be? Not only did the uh, Obama administration not apologize to me and, and offer me my job back, but I mean, they continued the investigation and, and in other instances went after people. One of the most disappointing things we've seen has been the president's commitment to going after the journalists that they've worked with when all they're doing is exposing wrongdoing. It's put a lot of journalists on the defensive to make them even more reluctant to work with whistleblowers. It really criminalizes the news gathering process. There just seems to be a disconnect here. You want aggressive journalism abroad, you just don't want it in the United States. Well, I, I, I would hesitate to speak to any particular case. The Obama administration had taken what was an understandable sense of governmental discipline and kind of gone over the top with it and began prosecuting every which way. There are some risks involved with publishing stories. You can be hauled into court for a very lengthy, expensive court battle if they are trying to get you to divulge your sources. Jim Risen of the New York Times is very familiar with this particular problem. Uh, Jim was subpoenaed in connection with a book he wrote. That case is still pending.
basic issue is whether or not you can have a democracy with, without aggressive investigative reporting, and I don't believe you can. After the grand jury, uh, after I testified, right, sitting in a room, ante room, out, outside of the grand jury, the, the lead prosecutor came out and told my lawyer, I don't know why he didn't tell me, because I'm sitting right there, but he told my lawyer that there weren't going to be any charges as a result of this you know, five, six, seven year investigation of total waste of taxpayers' dollars, total waste of FBI agents' time and effort. They could have been investigating somebody who really had hurt our country. Um, and, it, you know, it, it was a relief, but it was, it was also kind of, you know, is that it? I mean, is that, that's it. <laughs> How about, you know, uh, again, I, not, I guess I wasn't looking for an apology. I don't know what I was looking for, but I, I, I was angry. I am angry. I, I still am angry. And we still don't know how many people were uh, illegally wiretapped, and those people haven't been informed that their uh, communications were uh, intercepted, and I just think that's wrong. I think in many cases, um, and I think Tom Tams is one of them, uh, they've enriched our democracy. They're guarded by the truth. The truth eventually does set them free. During the period of time, it was a real financial struggle, and I have not really uh, recovered from that. Uh, so my family is still um, suffering as a result of what I did. Uh, my, that is truly my biggest regret, is what I put my family through. I sometimes wonder, did I accomplish anything other than, than kind of ruin a career? I loved working for the Department of Justice and walking the halls where I had walked as a little kid with my father. The building is very much the same. And did I accomplish anything? Well, I accomplished something and with the help of the media as so I let people know what was going on. I let people know that we're the greatest country in the world and we have a great government, but the government sometimes lies. You know, the little guy who uh, leaks a piece of information to a reporter uh, might lose his job, might go to jail, but he looks up above him and he sees senior officials in the White House sitting down for tell-all books because they know that if they don't tell their side of the story, they're not going to look so good in the books. Somehow or other, that never uh, gets, gets treated as a nefarious leak of, of uh, government secrets. People in high office leak all the time and they leak national security information quite often. A run-up to the Iraq war, where selective leaking took place all the time by senior uh, Bush administration officials who were trying to make the case that we ought to invade Iraq. John Brennan is allowed to leak to make the Obama administration look good without any kind of retaliation. When the government leaks for political gain, People get rewarded handsomely. But what they want out are the stories that cast them in a good light. And what they would like to prosecute are the ones that don't. And so um, that's the two tiers, really. You know, when we've got these people who have uh, practically limitless powers within a society, if they get a pass without so much as a slap on the wrist, what examples does that set for the next group of officials that come? to push the lines a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further, and we'll realize that we're no longer citizens, we're subjects. It's only the person who reveals the criminal activity who is prosecuted for it. And I would say I identify uh, very strongly with Bradley Manning because, uh, first of all, he was doing this because he felt crimes were being committed, uh, horrible things. He said, I'm prepared to go to prison for life or even be executed. So once again, it's the messenger. To me, the John Kiriakou case is so tragic because the guy who blew the whistle on the government's torture program is going to jail. I do meet the legal definition of whistleblowing, and that is someone who brings to light evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, or illegality. This conviction is not about leaking. This case was about torture from the very beginning. Those who, who conceived of the torture are free, those who destroyed evidence of the torture are free, and even the attorneys who papered over the torture are free. It's about believing in America and the Constitution and believing that your job is not just to do this. Your job is to, is to respect the Constitution. And I'm fortunate that's a losing position right now.
The federal government often makes examples both of citizens and employees within its own ranks who want to say something like, look, there's a problem going on here and I fear that taxpayers are getting ripped off in the process. The environment now is as chilling as they've seen it in a long time. You're going to lose your job. You're going to lose your livelihood. And people who used to talk to you will not take your phone calls anymore. That does have an intimidating effect, not just on leakers, it, it, it has an intimidating effect um, on the process. So when a whistleblower comes forward, you would think the government would want to find out what is going on and, and, and investigate the misconduct. But what happens is the hammer comes down and they shoot the messenger. And as a result, they come up with bad laws. And so it is extremely important for the national security state to punish in very severe ways whistleblowers because that is what they need to do to make an example out of them and to deter future whistleblowers. Senator Joe Lieberman has introduced the SHIELD Act, which would make it a crime to publish certain classified intelligence. But if you were to pass some of the legislation that is now on the in Congress, it would handcuff whistleblowers in a different, more profound way. You know, Senator Cardin of Maryland had actually uh, introduced legislation that would have tried to modernize the espionage. In other words, the people who know the most and who might actually be inclined to say something that would challenge the official line are the ones who are supposed to be uh, silent. Congress is pushing to prevent classified information from being made public. Now, there can be certainly bad leaks, but that's used as an excuse for keeping information from the public that we desperately need to have. Senator Dianne Feinstein is among a handful of congressional lawmakers who want to plug national security leaks using the law. The really are our modern day heroes and we need to be doing everything we can to be protecting them, to make sure that they have what it takes to protect our safety and our freedom and uh, we can't let them fight this fight alone. People just talk too much. Let me say it as simply as I can. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this presidency. There has been good news. The Congress has just passed the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act, which is really going to help federal employees. But what was still left unprotected was those employees who worked at the intelligence agencies. They were left out. So as a result of that, the president issued then separately a presidential decision directive that deals with whistleblowers in the intelligence agencies. The problem is there that it's really only protecting internal disclosures. It is not only not helping those people who go outside the system, but you have the Justice Department who actually prosecute them for doing it. Fear made us change some of our freedoms, and I think it's really important for the people to stick up for their freedoms and their civil liberties. The goal of terrorism is not just to kill people. The goal is to instill terror in people and to make them become what they are not. The Pentagon and the contractors are kind of masters of using the fear tactic to get more of our tax money, making billions and billions of dollars. But our nation was founded on speaking out, solving these problems. By clamping down on whistleblowers, we're working in the wrong direction. We're actually not making ourselves any safer. It's making us exactly the kind of government we don't want. The most important thing you can do is think critically. Look at the claims that are being put to you by authority figures, by teachers, by everyone around you, even by your friends and your family, the people that you love and you trust, and go, what do I think about this? What's the evidence to support it? There's a check of public opinion, and that can't take place if the public can't learn what's going on and if our sources are being prosecuted. It's an issue of great importance to reporters everywhere. But in terms of using the mechanisms of government to silence aggressive journalism, that's never worked in the past. It's not going to work now. We'll still be here when the smoke clears. The question is not just the recipe for strong individual, but it's what makes us really There was a grand experiment that was launched over 220 years ago. That's the country that I want to keep. The reason they gave protection to the First Amendment and the media is for the people to not be subject to prosecution because they question what the government is doing. It's one of the things that we fought for and something that I think sets us apart from an awful lot of other countries. The founding fathers didn't want it to be possible to be charged with treason in this country simply for disagreeing with the government. 
the founders established all of these safeguards to prevent abuse of power. And those are the very powers that have been acquired in the name of keeping America safe. We all have little differences in, in how much sort of inhumanity and incivility we can witness before it moves us to action. But we all have that line and it's up to you to decide what do you want to do? What do you want us to do? What will we do together? And make that contribution by standing up and not just saying something, but doing something. Hello, I'm Robert Greenwald. Thank you for watching The War on Whistleblowers. If you like what you just saw, hit that like button, share it, leave a comment, subscribe. If you'd like to host a screening, a free screening of any of our films, send us an email, screenings at bravenewfilms.org. Thanks for watching.